Welcome to Applied Mathematical Finance. Yeah, today I like to discuss with you the Heath-Sherrow-Morton framework, short rate models and forward rate models. So to some extent, we go back to this little picture here, which we had at the end of our you know, one of our very first sessions where we discussed the different interest rates. And yeah, there was already the argument that our forward rate, so here the queen curve, or forward rates, are just a discretized version yeah, of the continuous time forward rates. And the model that models the blue curve is the heath sherrow morton framework. And then there was also the short rate, which was just the starting point of this uh, blue curve and models just modeling the short rate are uh, the short rate models. So we had different classes uh, of you know, interest rates and then of interest rate uh, models. And all of these guys are connected, connected via the heath sherrow morton framework. And yeah, maybe to some extent, this is a more theoretical uh, section. Yeah, we will do some E2 lemma stuff, yeah, integrate, differentiate, and so on to uh, check the relation of the models. But it's also giving you a lot of intuition on what's going on. So for example, if the short rate models and the forward rate models can be viewed as part of the Heath-Sherrow Morton framework, then actually, our forward rate model, so the historical name LIBOR market model, can also be inter interpreted as a short rate model. So all these models are not different. They are just viewed from a different angle. And to have a little teaser yeah, on what we will maybe also understand now, uh, let's have a look at <clears throat> our forward rate simulation. So I have a little applet that uses our uh, Monte Carlo simulation of a discrete uh, forward rate. So you see here some uh, things that are maybe familiar, our correlation structure, the exponential decay correlation structure, there is one parameter here, and our uh, volatility structure. So this is the sigma, yeah, the sigma k of t. Yeah, So now it's written as sigma of little t and capital T, capital T being the maturity, our volatility structure, which also has here some exponential decay parameter. And then you can change time, simulation time, and let the interest rate curves be simulated. And you see here our uh, movements according to the factors. Yeah, we have now a good understanding of correlation. So these are the interest rates curves here that move between one and three percent and yeah as the time goes on yeah there is more and more volatility uh, on the curves and we stimulate different curves what i plot, plot here on the left side is uh, the short rate to some extent it is l of capital t to capital T plus delta T, yeah, fixed in capital T. So it's always the forward rate fixed uh, at the simulation time. So if I go back to this picture, what you plot on the left is this uh, forward rate here for the first time step. And then if simulation moves on, you plot this forward rate. Yeah? And then if simulation moves on, you plot the next forward rate. So it's to some extent the path that has been followed by the short rate in a discretized uh, sense. And now you can make the observation yeah, that the value of the short rate becomes here wider and wider yeah, because it is more volatile. But if you now increase the exponential decay in the forward rate volatility, yeah, say to 5% or even stronger, 10% or even stronger, say 20%, there is something happening to the short rate and suddenly the short rate becomes wide and then it stays within a certain corridor. So the, the short rate model will suddenly exhibit 
a feature which in the model, we can recover in the model, is then termed mean reversion. So when the path is, uh, say, uh, deviating from the mean, yeah, it is pulled back. Yeah, mean reversion, such that all the paths stay within uh, within a corridor. Yeah, so there is some kind of uh, gravity here around this this line and, and pulling these paths back. Yeah, and this effect can then become yeah, very 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 strong. No? So you can make this strong, and you see everything stays here within a quite narrow corridor. So we have the link exponential decay in time to maturity of the forward rate is mean reversion of the short rate. And we can understand this effect very nicely if we now study the Heath-Scherer modern framework and then study how the two models or how the model families or how the model primitives yeah, uh, embed in this uh, framework. So the Heath-Jero Morton framework postulates an e-to-stochastic process as a model for the instantaneous forward rate. So the instantaneous forward rate was here our F. Yeah. So uh, to some extent, this is the time continuous analog of our discrete forward rate LK of little t, where this parameter here, the t, takes the role of the k. Yeah, The k was associated with a tk, the fixing time of this, this rate. So we have an e to stochastic process driven by an m-dimensional Brownian motion. So dw. And uh, this is here written under P, yeah, so the drift is still here under P. And um, if this is an M-dimensional Brownian motion, okay, then you have to note, okay, this here is a scalar product. So what you have there is the sum k from 1 to m sigma k dwk. So if you would like to link it to our discretized version, this sigma k corresponds to our lambda i k, the i being here the capital T and the K being the factor in front of the corresponding uh, Brownian motion. So you find it in this form in the literature, and uh, these are uncorrelated Brownian components. So it was the form where we often used the letter U for the Brownian motion, D-U-K. Yeah, you can move to uh, an equivalent uh, martingale measure if you choose a numerea. So we choose as numerea, our accrual account where we continuously invest according to the current short rate in an infinitesimal time period. So this corresponds then to our discrete rolling bond account where we always invest according to the yeah, current observed forward rate for the current period. Well, this product it can be written as an exponential of a sum of the logarithm
Okay, and the logarithm of one plus x is approximately x. Yeah. So you see that uh, what you have here is approximately exponential of a sum. Logarithm of one plus x is approximately x. So it's li of ti times delta ti, yeah? So the integral becomes a sum, the d tau becomes the delta ti, and the short rate is the forward rate observed for the current period. So you really see the connection that our heath morton framework is the continuous time version of our discrete model, or uh, maybe more precise, uh, our discrete forward rate model can be seen as a discretization of this uh, heath Jerome morton model here. And um, you can also really specify uh, the parameters of this heath Jerome morton model such that you exactly, not in an approximate sense, exactly recover the discrete forward rate model. So we start with this model. The initial value yeah, is here given as a continuous time curve T uh, parameterizing the maturity. If you model this forward rate, yeah, what was the instantaneous forward rate? It was something like the slope of the Cirocopper bond curve. Yeah actually the slope of the log of the zero copper bond curve, then you can recover all zero copper bond prices. So we also had this at the end of our interest rate section that we can recover all zero copper bond values once we know uh, the uh, instantaneous forward rates. And the expression is similar to what we had for the uh, forward rates. For the forward rates, the zero copper bond was the product of one plus L times delta Ti, Li de de times delta Ti to the power of minus one. So it's one divided by the product. Again, here I have the product is the exponential of a sum. Yeah, So it's exponential because it is one divided by exponential minus the integral from little t to capital T, f of t tau d tau. So this tau parameter here is the maturity The little t is our simulation time parameter. So the time when we observe the curve. So the object is of course then ft measurable. So this is just the same little t as in our forward rate. So this is a model framework. So I used uh, the word framework here. And the point is that the specific choice of sigma will then create different models. So we have a model within the model, like for our discretized uh, forward rate model. And by choosing sigma, you can create a specific short rate model, or you can also create our discrete forward rate model. Let's have a look at the first thing. How does the short rate process look if we have specified uh, the dynamic for the forward rate. So how does the short rate process look in the HGM framework? So I have my model in differential notation. So we 
just integrate. So first step is integrate. So the forward rate observed in time little t for maturity capital T is the initial value F0 of capital T plus the integral over the drift alpha yeah, integral with respect to simulation time, the little t, so alpha S capital T dS plus the integral over the diffusion part, yeah, my stochastic integral, integral sigma of S dW of S. So now I have that the short rate is actually just FTT. Yeah, so what do I get if I observe the forward rate, the simulated forward rate curve at the current uh, simulation time? So just plug this in. So I just plug in here. For the capital T, I plug in the little t. So I have that the short rate R of T is F0 of T, so the initial value. Uh, yeah, so what we have observed in time zero for that maturity. And then integrate the drift with respect to the first argument observed in little t, integrate the sigma, the diffusion part with respect here to, to the first argument. And now I can apply the differential again. So next step is apply the differential. So differentiate this. So this means I differentiate with respect to my simulation time in that sense. Yeah. So this means differentiate the initial value with respect to little t, yeah, my function f0 is a function of maturity, capital T. So I write the differential as df of df0 by d capital T. But of course, I plug in the little t. Then next step is differentiate the integrated drift with respect to little t. Yeah, there are two little t's here. The first one is the upper bound of the integral. If you differentiate the upper bound of the integral, you just get the integrand where s has to be replaced by this upper bound. No, the little t. So I get alpha tt. And then I get a second part. The second part is differentiate here with respect to the second argument. This gives me invert differentiation and integration. So this gives me differentiate under the integral, the alpha with respect to its second argument. We call it its second argument capital T. So it's d alpha by d capital T s of uh, of S and little t integrated with respect to S. So then the same thing for the diffusion part. So for the diffusion part, I also observe there are two little t's lying around there. So differentiate with respect to the upper bound here of the integral gives me the integrand evaluated at s equals little t, dw of little t, yeah, so sigma t, t, dw of t. So it gives me this part, and then differentiate also the sigma under the integral. So this gives me then the integral from zero to t, d sigma by d capital T, because we call it the second argument capital T times uh, dw. So this is um, what we have. Yeah, So we have um, a complicated drift. There is a complicated drift here in the short rate. And yeah, the nice thing is that the diffusion looks maybe like you would expect it. It's just the sigma tt dw of t. Yeah, you just get the diffusion of the 
F, yeah, uh, at time capital T replaced by little t. There is one remarkable thing uh, in the uh, drift. Uh, the initial value appears here as a function in the drift. So this means there is a relation between the drift and the shape of the interest rate that is being manifested. So this is the reason why the drift in a short rate model is a free parameter that is used to calibrate uh, the model. So to some extent, this part here is your no arbitrage constraint that you are under the measure Q. Okay, why? Because there is such a constraint here for the alpha. But in the drift, there also appears this part here, which then makes the drift a free parameter. I will later need these uh, three lines here, or especially here the last representation of the short rate model. Yeah? So this is an important, uh, important slide here. So, uh, yeah, summary what we have done. Yeah, so first uh, um, uh, integrate and then uh, differentiate and just uh, be sure that when you differentiate, you observe that they are uh, different t's uh, either in the upper bound or in the uh, second argument of of the drift uh, of the drift and the diffusion parameter yeah speaking of uh, the drift and the no arbitrage constraint of course uh, when we move to measure q you know, this means that there is a special uh, condition on the drift yeah the risk neutral measure uh, defined by traded asset derived by my numeraire should be Martingales. Yeah, so this uh, imposes a condition on the drift. Like for our forward rate model, yeah, we derive the drift under the spot measure, under the terminal measure. Our measure here, the measure that corresponds to the numeraire B. So our QB is the analog to the spot measure. Okay, so you always invest in the next zero copper bond and, and here it is, uh, I always invest in over an infinitesimal time period yeah, in an infinitesimal zero copper bond. So how does this uh, drift uh, look like? And uh, the theorem states here, okay, the relation between the drift alpha yeah, so our alpha superscript Q yeah, so moving to Q of I get of course here an alpha superscript Q but if I'm now under my measure uh, related to the numeria B I just drop the superscript Q so the condition is that the integral from S to capital T, alpha of little s, capital S, integrated over the maturity, is equal this scalar product of the corresponding integral of the factor loadings uh, of the diffusion uh, coefficient. Okay, so I integrate here um, over the maturity. So this is the drift observed at um, a given simulation time. Yeah, so this is for all little s. Yeah, uh, the specification of the drift. Let's uh, differentiate this here with respect to capital T. Yeah? So differentiate it uh, with respect to maturity. So this will yeah remove here the integral. And here on the right hand side, I have the product of two functions that uh, depend on capital T. So by the product rule, I get two times differentiate here one integral, the other one uh, stays. So I have that the drift condition is that my drift alpha observed in little t for the maturity capital T is sigma of little t capital T multiplied with the integral 
of sigma over all maturities. And this is also very similar or analog to what we had for our drift in our discrete forward rate model under the spot measure. Yeah? What was the drift for the for the forward rate under the spot measure. So we had mu of t. Okay, so how was it? It was a sum running from j equals m of t to i. So this was the drift for the forward rate i. I believe it was i minus one, right? Yeah. And then it was sigma i, sigma j, rho i j. Okay, there was some guy here divided by one plus l j delta t j. But this is the form where we write it with correlations. If we write it with factor loadings, it was the scalar product, k okay, from one to m, lambda i k, lambda j k. So you see that this is uh, very similar. You can move this scalar product to the outside. We did this for the efficient implementation of the drift because this does not depend on j. So I have here the sum lambda i k, k from one to m, and then the sum over all maturities. So if you forget a little bit about this uh, factor that is maybe it is approximately one, the guy here, yeah, then you see this is uh, very similar. You have the scalar product of the factor loading that is in front of the diffusion with the integral of the factor loading that is in front of the diffusion integrated over all uh, maturities j yeah, from the current observed time to the maturity associated with your current forward rate. Very, very analog. So this is the Heath-Jerome-Morton drift condition. Yeah, so if uh, traded assets, so zero copper bond divided by the numeraire should be a martingale, then the drift alpha uh, looks like that. So here's the proof. Yeah, maybe we go a bit uh, quickly through the proof because it's uh, just the same scheme. So I have my numeraire. My numeraire is the reinvestment according to the short rate. So it is exponential integral R of S ds. And I have my traded asset on the market. And now I have a continuous time family of traded assets. Yeah, so I have zero copper bonds. You do the same trick. Zero copper bond divided by the numeraire is a stochastic process. And this stochastic process should be um, um, a QB martingale. So you know the drift of this guy is zero. So let's use uh, Ito's lemma and check uh, what is the drift of uh, this guy. First, what is this guy? Um, exponential x of t and um, x. Yeah, so I divide here uh, two um, exponentials. So dividing the two exponential is the exponential of the zero copper bond argument minus the uh, argument of the numeraire, yeah, so it is the exponential of minus integrate the forward rate over the maturity minus integrate the short rate. So that's my x here. So my x is minus integrate 
the forward rate over maturities from little t to capital T, the capital T associated with my seal copper bond I'm observing, minus integrate uh, the short rate. So just plug in the definition of uh, the forward rate stochastic process. So this is the initial value plus integrate the drift plus integrate the diffusion. So this is just plugged in the um, stochastic process here for the forward rate. And then also plug in the short rate process. So I just plug in this one. So it's the initial value of the forward rate and integrate the drift and integrate the diffusion, but just where capital T is replaced by uh, little t. So I get the same three guys, the initial value, the alpha and the sigma. Yeah. So you can now rearrange a bit the terms. Okay, so the first two lines is just uh, what, what we need uh, to copy. It. And I can introduce, say, A and Sigma, capital A and Sigma. So all the guys that are in front of a DS will be collected to this um, a and all the real guys that are in front of a DW will be collected to my sigma. So I have that dx is a dt capital sigma DW, where okay, the initial value of the stochastic process x is just the integral of the initial value of the forward rate curve. The a is just the integrate integral of the alpha, and the sigma is just the integral of the sigma coefficient over uh, all the maturities. So this is how this um, x uh, looks like. Yeah? So I have that exponential of this guy is a martingale. So d exponential of x has drift zero. This is my stochastic process x. This is how its drift and its diffusion coefficient look like. So let's just differentiate exponential of x. So if you differentiate exponential of x, you get exponential of x dx, but you also, we have stochastic processes, get a second order term. So you get one half, yeah, Ito's lemma, one half exponential of x dx dx. So you can move the exponential in front. Yeah, you have it here and here. And inside you have um, from the dx dx, And uh, one half sigma squared. So from the one half dx dx, you have a one half sigma squared. Well, my sigma is a vector. Yeah? So sigma was actually our lambda i k vector, if you think, yeah, for different k's. So our sigma is a vector. It is the factor loadings in front of the Brownian motion, yeah, a row vector, row times column, the Brownian motion is the column, yeah, the factor loadings. So this capital sigma is also a vector. Yeah. So this here is, of course, um, a scalar product, yeah, so sigma times sigma tra transposed. Right? If sigma is a row vector, it's sigma times sigma transposed, it's the scalar product. Yeah, you see that, that you just get this um, one half uh, sigma squared, yeah, just from Ito's lemma because there was the exponential in both guys. Yeah, um, this also links back to differentiating the product when we did it in the discrete setup. So this means that this is a martingale. So this part here has to be zero. 
So we have that this is zero, and hence we get our, our, our drift condition. So actually the proof is much shorter than for the discrete analog where we have differentiate these products and got all these sums out of it. Okay, this uh, capital sigma actually has an interpretation. It is the bond uh, volatility. Yeah, so it is the um, volatility parameter appearing in the stochastic process of a zero copper bond uh, written as a log normal process. No, nice, nice interpretation. So now comes the thing that, yeah, I have derived alpha. Alpha is not a free parameter. Alpha is given by um, the no arbitrage uh, condition. So now comes the interesting thing that claim all other models are now special version of the Heischer Martin framework when we choose sigma. No? So our only three parameters are the initial shape of the curve. No? So that is maybe already calibrated because we observe the interest rate curve today. And our uh, volatility function. So this is the model within the model and we will show now that short rate models or our uh, live market model can be just interpreted as special choices for the sigma. Also nice for, for our discrete forward rate model, it is not a discretization of the Heath-Jerome Morton framework uh, in the sense that it's approximating it. It is the Heath-Jerome Morton framework for a special sigma function. Yeah? So this is not a discretization in the sense of an uh, approximation um, or that you do it for uh, discretizing it in the computer. It is a special sigma that will exactly create the discrete model. It will be just a discretized sigma that generates the discretized uh, forward rate model. This is This is really interesting. So I, st I start with uh, the short rate models. So we have already done this. Yeah? So let's go back. So that is the slide that connects the Heath-Jerome Morton framework to the short rate process. Yeah? So the thing is that I now have to specify here this sigma of little t and capital T such that if both arguments are the same, I get the diffusion of the corresponding short rate model and the structure generates somehow the drift that we observe in the in the short rate model. So I go now the other way. I have maybe different short rate models and I ask myself, what is the corresponding sigma in the Heath-Jerome Morton model in the heath jerome Morton framework that represents this short rate model. Okay, short rate models, yeah, we model the short rate. Uh, I model the parameter R of T. So this is the slope of the zero copper bond price curve at the current observation time, capital T equals little t. So it's here, this guy that we model, yeah, it's it's a process that models just a single scalar quantity. And th that's a bit the reason why short rate models were so popular because they just model a single scalar uh, quantity. We choose as numerair well, we only have the short rate. Yeah? So what do I choose as numerair? I choose as numerair our money market account, our bank account, where we invest over an infinitesimal small time period at the short rate. And then I move to the equivalent martingale measure and I say, okay, I have the short rate process under the Q. Yeah? So there is here my mu Q. Um, where the Q is the measure that corresponds to 
את נאמר A, B. I can recover already all zero copper bond prices by this because a zero copper bond is just evaluate paying one in capital T. So one in capital T divided by the numerea, so the zero copper bond value in capital T divided by the numerea in capital T. Uh, so take the expectation, multiply with the numerea in little t, gives you the zero copper bond uh, value. So you have also the zero copper bond value in terms of your short rate process. But in contrast, for example, to our discrete forward rate model, you need to integrate here the short rate process over its whole time. Yeah. So, uh, so I do not have an I have an expression in terms of the short rate observed in, uh, say little t for the zero copper bond. Yeah? So you have to integrate the short rate process over the simulation time up to the maturity, and then you take back the expectation. So this is um, different like in our forward rate model where I can express the zero copper bond in terms of all quantities I observe at that time. Yeah, There was no expectation involved. But for many short rate models, you have analytic formulas of the zero copper bond price. So the short rate models were popular because the underlying process is just a, a, a one dimensional stochastic process, so scalar valued. So you could use many numerical techniques, yeah, binomial trees, uh, partial differential equations, yeah, where you just have time and space. Yeah. Uh, so it's it's uh, very nice uh, from from that point of view. But the class is maybe also uh, limited, yeah. At least if you if you want to have a Markovian model, yeah, where you, for example, have an analytic formula for the zero bond price, then the class is limited. Just some names. Uh, this measure Q yeah, is often also just called the risk-neutral measure. Maybe a bit mis misleading. This this term. Yeah, it is uh, DB is R B. DT. Yeah. So it is what we have in our discrete setup as the spot measure. So here's a list of some short rate models. So you see there is uh, there are maybe three groups here. Yeah. So there is the Vasicek model. DR is B minus AR DT sigma dw or the hull white model which is then just um, a generalization where the b can be time dependent yeah and the sigma can be time dependent and here in this hull white model you have here in the drift a term phi of t minus r a r and this term generates this effect of mean reversion. So if the short rate is, for example, larger than, okay, it is larger than phi of t divided by this a, then the drift is negative. And if it is smaller, then the drift is positive. Yeah. So you have somewhere this uh, phi, uh, phi of t divided by a, and when the short rate moves above this line, it is pulled down by the drift and when the short rate moves below this line, it is pulled up by the drift, such that maybe this path yeah, likes to stay around this 
this this phi. Yeah. So this is something that is often called the mean reversion. So the model allows to model this effect of mean reversion that interest rates do not fly away yeah, due to their diffusion. Yeah, the diffusion here uh, will just push them further away from, from this, this mean. Then you have some other models. Okay, this looks like a normal dynamic. So here some negative interest rates are positive. Okay, you have some other models that have here an R in front of the diffusion, yeah, sigma R, dW, or where you model the logarithm of R, which is very similar, or a third version where you have here a square root. I have here, I have here two examples for the whole Lee and the Hal White, how they map to the East Sherrow Morton framework. So let's discuss now immersion of the short rate model uh, and maybe also forward rate model in the Heath-Sherrow Morton framework. So that was my um, Heath-Sherrow Morton framework. So my dynamic of the forward rate, yeah, alpha dt plus sigma dw with this initial value. So this was here our number 152 above. Yeah, where we had these nice three steps and where we derived the short rate process. So this was here the short rate process. My 155, yeah, so um, integrate the forward rate, plug in for capital T, the little t, and differentiate. So what we what we did here. So how do we choose this guy to get a corresponding short rate model? Let's start for the whole Lee model. So my claim is that the whole Lee model is just the heath morton model for the special choice. Sigma is a constant. Yeah, clearly, if you have sigma as a constant, then I have here just sigma dw. Okay, so this guy is already okay, my sigma dw. And what do I get for the alpha? So alpha, the risk neutral drift. Yeah. So alpha was sigma scalar product integral of sigma. Yeah? Integral of sigma over all maturities. Yeah. So like my lambda ik multiplied with lambda ij integrated over all j's. So uh, sigma is a constant, yeah? So it is just sigma integral over sigma, integral over sigma, sigma is a constant. So it's just sigma squared, and then the time to maturity, capital T minus little t. So this is my alpha. So my heath Shaw morton model would look like that. Yeah, df is sigma squared t minus t dt plus sigma dw. That would be my heath Shaw morton model. How does the short rate model look like? So what do I have to do? I have alpha tt. Alpha tt is zero. Yeah, capital T is equal to little t. And I have differentiate alpha with respect to capital T and integrate over the little t. So this is, this is this part here, with a time dependent function of, of t for the drift. So let's do, yeah, more interesting for us, the uh, Hull-White model. So let's go back to our to our list of short rate models. So I would like to investigate the Hull White model because this is the interesting guy that has here a phi of t a times r, this mean reversion part in the drift. Yeah? The diffusion is just done function uh, sigma of t, which can depend on time. So how does now the Hull White model, so our short rate model, look in the heath morton framework. So my claim is that an exponentially decaying 
forward rate volatility function will create the hull wide short rate dynamic. So the dynamic of the short rate has a, a drift in a diffusion and the diffusion parameter was easy. So the diffusion parameter was just sigma of TT. So this is just sigma of TT. So sigma of TT is just this sigma and you can make this parameter here time dependent if you like yeah so i i just have chosen it here to be constant so my diffusion part will just be this sigma dw okay so this guy is um okay how does now the drift look like so recall what is the drift in the short rate model So it is this complicated expression, differentiate the initial value, alpha TT, and then differentiate the alpha with respect to capital T, integrate over S, TS, differentiate the diffusion parameter sigma with respect to capital T, integrate S, TS. So this is here my drift for the short rate. Alpha TT, integrate alpha, integrate uh, sigma. So differentiating sigma with respect to capital T. Okay, this is just here a minus A capital T. So I get a minus A in front. Yeah. And then I just have the same function again, my sigma of S and capital T, DW. Yeah, and then I have the ugly problem that I have an integral over DW inside my drift. And how do I get rid of this? Yeah, there is an easy trick. The easy trick is that just plug in the whole short rate process. Yeah. So this A times the integral is, so my short rate R of T is F of TT. And then I can plug in the solution that F of TT is the initial value. So it is F of zero, capital T is little t now, plus integrate alpha s of capital T, yeah, is little t, ds, plus integrate sigma s t dw. So I can plug in, or I can replace this diffusion part here, which is here, by actually just the short rate minus the initial value and the integrated forward rate drift. So it is minus the integrated forward rate drift, since I already have a minus in front, it is a plus here, and minus the initial value, since I have the minus in front, it's just a plus here. Yeah. So I can replace this guy, the integral over the diffusion, with minus A times R plus some other stuff here that comes from uh, the in integral of the drift of my uh, instantaneous, instantaneous forward rate. So you see that this here, this guy, is exactly the guy that I need to create this mean reversion. Yeah. So this is the guy that creates the mean reversion.
So it is a minus a times r. And all the other guys are now just functions of time. In addition, you have the initial value here. So you can plug all the other stuff into the function phi. So this is just your function phi. So you have phi of t minus a times r of t. And you can calibrate, you can specify the shape of the function phi because all these guys here are just given. And you can choose the initial value. Okay, you can you can choose here the function f of zero. Okay, this is how the phi uh, looks like. And if you like, you can calculate also the alpha from the given uh, specified sigma. So from the specification of sigma, so phi actually has an expression. So you get from the sigma this part here, and you have as a free parameter the initial value of the forward rate uh, curve appearing here. So this also shows you how you calibrate uh, the model to an observed forward rate curve by yeah, using this function phi here, given that you have an exponential decaying function in in your in your volatility. Okay, so we see I get this mean reversion effect by using an exponential decay in the forward rate volatility structure. Yeah? So this this parameter here. The A in front somehow describes how strong is the mean reversion. Yeah, so you you can multiply the forward rate here yeah, with with um, this A. So this is the mean reversion speed. Yeah? So it is phi times dt. Yeah, so you can interpret this here as a speed. So the parameter A that appears here comes from the exponential decay rate. So the exponential decay rate defines the mean reversion speed of the short rate. So this is our model and we have this nice interpretation for the mean reversion. Yeah? So um, the volatility function of the instantaneous forward rate, if this guy has an exponential decay, this corresponds to a mean reversion term for the short rate process. Ah. So let's go back to our little uh, toy. Yeah? So this is visible in the forward rate model. The forward rate model, the discrete forward rate model is just uh, a discretization. Yeah? I will come to this, but maybe let's go back here to our little toy where we simulated this. So the exponential decay rate creates this mean reversion. Yeah, Okay, if it is zero, you have something that is very diffusive in the short rate. And if it becomes larger, then you have this mean reversion effect. Okay, have we understood this mean reversion effect? Maybe we have not yet understood this mean reversion effect. So why is this happening? And you get now a very good intuition if you play with this toy here. So actually what you have on the right-hand side is that forward rates have an exponential decaying volatility structure. Yeah? So if you have a zero here, no exponential decay, all forward rate get the same volatility. Okay. Maybe they have some, some independence by the factors, but they get the same volatility. If you now increase this decay, it means that forward rate on the short end move strongly because their time to maturity is uh, smaller. Uh, you could also say that there is some kind of shape in your factors yeah, when, you, when you now apply the 
random number, yeah, the GW, the, the risky shift. Okay, and how much do volatility do we get if we move to its maturity? So if you look at this forward rate here at, uh, fixed, how much volatility do we get until the rate is fixed? Well, the volatility that we get is the integrated variance, integral sigma squared, sigma k squared of t from little t to uh, uh, or from zero to tk. Yeah? This is the volatility that is accumulated over time. Yeah? So the volatility would be the square root. So this is the variance that is accumulated over time until the forward rate fixed fixes. And now the exponential function, exponential minus ax, has a very nice property. The integral from zero to infinity is bounded. Yeah? So it means that regardless how far away the forward rate in the future is, the accumulated volatility until its fixing is a constant. Uh, remains limited. Uh, so it does not accumulate more and more volatility if it is further away in the future. Uh, this, is the, this is the property of the exponential decaying function that integrating over it re remains uh, bounded. Uh, bounded yeah? Integral uh, exponential minus ax from zero to infinity. Yeah, okay, it is one divided by a yeah, with, with a minus, yeah. Upper bound, uh, zero is a one. Uh, lower bound, infinity is zero. Yeah, So it's a, it's just a one divided by A. So if you take the square of it, it is, it is uh, just uh, one divided by two A, whatever. Um, so uh, the volatility accumulated until it's fixing is constant, which means if you now let this evolve, if you have an exponential decay, it means that all the rates get the same volatility. So this is what is happening. All the rates get the same volatility, and then they are fixed. Yeah? So they get fewer volatility when they are further away, and they get more volatility when they are closer to its fixing. And in integral, in sum, they get the same volatility. So this is the reason why we have this effect, and we have full diffusion if we if we have a, uh, have a zero yeah. yeah of course i'm not integrating up to infinity i'm integrating up to um, a finite time horizon and because of this it is that um, a small exponential decay yeah for example three uh, percent will still show that the short rate grows yeah but then at, at, at some point it will uh, the effect will stop Okay, so we have very nicely understood uh, what is happening here. So this is our forward rate simulation. So the rates that we plot here are the L of Tk, Tk plus 1, fixed in Ti, if this point here, say, is the time Ti. Okay, so this is yeah, k larger or equal i. So this is the future curve. And the points that we have observed here are the LTJ, Tj plus 1, fixed in Tj. Yeah? So this is the maybe analog to a short rate yeah? where all these guys here are the Tj's, the different Tj's, yeah? J, smaller or equal smaller or equal i yeah so on the left hand side you see the discrete version of the short rate on the right hand side you see the discrete forward rate curve yeah so uh, you have this 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 little thing if you like to experiment with this you can also go to our experiment repository In this program, where I had very many experiments related to our forward rate model, and this is doing exactly what I have on the slide. It plots the forward rates 
but evaluate it such that they correspond to the discrete version of the short rate. So this is in the code here. There is this experiment test short rate. If you look at test short rate, it is just doing our model yeah, with a different exponential decay parameters, 0, 4%, 8%, 12%, different exponential decay parameters. And then it's just asking, yeah, my forward rate model, give me the forward rate t observed in little t starting period capital T end period capital T plus delta T. So this is capital T, capital T, capital T plus delta T. This is L, T, T plus delta T observed in T. Yeah? So I just plot this. Yeah? And if you now run this little program, I'm plotting this function. You can view this effect on the short rate that if you increase the volatility decay parameter, you have this mean reversion effect. Yeah? Also very nice here, there is this quay path that uh, explodes a little bit, yeah, up to 100% here of interest rates. And this is then pulled back by the mean reversion. Yeah? As you see, internally the shape is the same. Yeah, it's the same random number sequence that was used to gen generate the path, but the drift is pulling this path uh, back. Yeah, you can play a little bit with this. Let's conclude and have a look how does our discrete forward rate model look in the HGM framework. So I made the claim that I can choose here the volatility function sigma such that I get a discrete forward rate model. So actually I get our version 109, the guy that had the correlation structure, um, if uh, I also apply here the factor loading matrix to our independent Brownian increments du. So now I use here uh, the letter du to make this a little bit um, more consistent with my notation I had for the for the forward rate model. So this here is a scalar product. Yeah? So recall there is here a dot that this is a scalar product. So this is some k from one to m sigma of t capital T sigma k, the case component multiplied with duk. And this corresponds in our notation to the sum k from one to m lambda i k of t duk of t, where the I is the index of the forward rate for which I apply this, which corresponds to here the time capital capital T. So how do I choose this uh, sigma? First, how do we link the instantaneous forward rate F to our discrete forward rate L? So we had this little picture here. And already in this little picture, I suggested that my discrete forward rate L, so my time discretized interest rate curve, is somehow an average of what we observe for the F. And this is true. Yeah, they link over the zero copper bond. So I have that the zero copper bond is exponential minus integral of the instantaneous forward rate. But I also have that 
the ratio of two zero copper bonds, bond at the starting point of the period divided by bond at the end of the period relates nicely to my forward rate. So this is one plus Li of T times delta Ti. Yeah? So this is the rate accumulated over this period. So I have the nice relation that one plus L delta T is exponential integral F integrated over the maturity parameter. So the second argument here integrated from start of the period to the end of the period. Yeah? Uh, on both sides, I have random variables that are F little t measurable. So every, everything fits together. If you take, for example, the logarithm, let's take maybe uh, the logarithm. So you have a logarithm one plus Li delta Ti equals integral f of t tau d tau. So then you see on the right-hand side, you have the average. If the logarithm is approximated by, logarithm of one plus x is approximated by Li times delta Ti, you see that you can divide by the delta Ti, and you have that the forward rate is the time average of the instantaneous forward rate. Discrete forward rate is really the time average of the instantaneous forward rate in a special sense, yeah, in the special sense that it is one plus Li delta Ti is exponential. So that's the link between the two. So I have a functional uh, correspondence. I uh, could just um, apply uh, Ito's lemma. Yeah. So I now introduce x as being this time average of the instantaneous forward rate. So here's my instantaneous forward rate. I do the time average over the maturity. The one divided by delta Ti is missing. Mm -hmm. So um, then I can link now the forward rate to this x. I would like to apply Ito's lemma. So what do I get if I differentiate this capital X? Yeah, I just switch differentiation and integration. I just differentiate under the integral. So I have for my DL, So recall one plus Li delta Ti is now exponential of this x. Yeah? So if I differentiate here on the left-hand side, I get DL delta Ti. On the right-hand side, it is D exponential of x. Differentiating the exponential gives me with Ito's lemma exponential of x dx plus one-half dx dx. Let's plug in the definition of the x again. So you have here in front the exponential, and then you have integrate, yeah, because I have the integral in the dx here, integrate df. This is the dx. And integrate df multiplied with integrate df. This is the dx dx. If you now plug in the definition of the df, This is the alpha dt plus sigma dw, but we also had this nice short notation for integrating the coefficients. The, this was my capital A and my sigma. We get, yeah, together with this integral, that this can be represented as A plus one half capital sigma, capital sigma yeah, dt. Yeah? So this is the integral 
over my TF. This is the drift part and the diffusion part. Yeah, this the diffusion part is also just integrate sigma du. Okay, so the diffusion part is just the integral integral sigma du. I'm not so much interested in the drift part. So you see that what we get for the diffusion is just the integral So you have here the time average, yeah, the integral ti to ti plus one of sigma observed in little t integrated over the maturity tau, d tau, and then you have the times du. So times du, yeah, du of little t with this scalar product. So if you specify your forward rate, instantaneous forward rate volatility function, and you look how does the discrete forward rate look like. This is my discrete forward rate here. How does it look like? You see that you get for the diffusion part, very naturally just time average the diffusion coefficient over the maturities, the diffusion co coefficient of the instantaneous forward rate to get the corresponding diffusion coefficient for the discrete forward rate. Yeah, So it is just a time average. The delta ti uh, is here. Yeah? So if you now divide here with the delta ti, you see that you have a time averaged volatility function. Okay, so I can maybe forget about the drift part and I have this nice expression here for the diffusion part of my forward rate stochastic process. They are There are two additional terms. I have the delta Tx here. So let's divide by the delta Tx. And I have the exponential x here in front. Yeah? So because the L is exponential integral, the forward rate, yeah? if I differentiate that, I get the exponential integrate the forward rate again, again in front. So I get another factor, one plus Li delta Ti here in front. So apart from this, it looks very, very natural. Yeah. So I just have here a time averaged volatility function. There is this, this strange guy here yeah? and uh, a constant delta Ti. So now let's choose this here to match our specification of our forward rate model. Uh, if I would like to have the correlation structure, the first step in choosing this guy is that I multiply the GU with my factor matrix that generates the correlation. So I have here my factor matrix F. Uh, so F is my factor matrix. Yeah, these guys are now the row vectors of my factor matrix. Yeah, So my uh, lambda i k yeah, and it is the i-th row yeah, that you see here. So this is the first step but I also would like to have a volatility function here so I would have here I would like to have here also my sigma i of t yeah, the volatility function that belongs to this forward rate. So let's apply this so I have my i's row that creates the correlation and I have my forward rate volatility function sigma i of t. And then I just like to get rid of this factor here. So I just divide by this factor.
So I just divide by the one plus Li delta Ti, and there's a small typo here. There should be also multiply with the delta delta Ti here on top, yeah? Because I also would like to get this, this factor away. Um, if I choose this, and now you see that this is piecewise constant. So I choose this with an I here related to where the maturity parameter tau of the instantaneous forward rate, yeah, so this here is the model parameter for my instantaneous forward rate, this is the model parameter for my discrete forward rate, where this tau is. So you have here a piecewise constant function, okay? So this integral here, ah, wait, no, there was no typo, right? This integral is just a delta ti, yeah? So it just cancels this guy here, right? Yeah, this is nice. So if you, if you just choose this as a piecewise constant function, divide by this factor in front, then you have that you get exactly the structure of our discrete forward rate term structure model, sigma i, and because you have the f du is the dw, sigma i dwi. So you can, you can specify here a volatility function in the Heath-Jerome-Morton framework, a piecewise constant, so a discretized volatility function with maybe some small additional correction that then creates exactly our discrete uh, term, structure, term structure model. Yeah, I have then my discrete term structure model. DLI is mu i dt plus sigma i of only little t, sigma i, yeah, uh, dwi, every forward rate driven by its own driver's correlation structure created by our factor loading matrix. The drift is the drift from the, uh, implied by the Heath-Jerome-Morton framework, yeah, and this is here uh, our drift. We should now check that actually this drift exactly matches the drift that we had derived for our forward rate model, and you can indeed do this. Yeah? Uh, you see, you have here the sigma. Sigma is now piecewise constant, so the integral over the tau parameter piecewise constant becomes a sum, so you get all these sums in our uh, drift function, and also you see that the sigma contains here the one plus Li delta Ti, and remember that in our drift there was sigma i, sigma i, rho i, j, uh, sorry, the, in our drift there was sigma i, sigma j, rho i, j, but divided with one plus Li delta Ti, multiplied with one plus delta, uh, one plus Lj delta Tj, yeah? So there was this strange term, and this strange term is actually coming here from here, which is coming from here that we need to remove it here, which was coming here from this exponential function. So, uh, yeah, the discrete forward rate model is the HGM framework, yeah, is generated if the volatility structure is piecewise constant in capital T, and there is a small additional thing. Yeah, so you see this here is time continuous. If the little t is larger than the ti, you just set the volatility to zero. So this part here, 
is actually an interesting thing. It corresponds to the assumption that our short period bond is this deterministic. So if you would like to model the short period bond in our discrete forward rate model, uh, you actually have to specify maybe something uh, to, to fill this gap. Yeah, so because this here implies that my forward rate for periods that are smaller, yeah, that are in between, have no volatility. Yeah, so but you could could specify something uh, different here. Yeah, so this this is uh, the gap in the discrete forward rate model that models the fractional forward rates. And here I just was lazy and I just set it to zero. Uh, so you also see that below I did not need uh, the specification of this to derive the dynamic of dynamic dynamic of the forward rate. This slide now just checks that the drift that you observe by this choice by this piecewise constant function matches the drift that we have derived in the previous uh, chapters. Yeah, so in the chapters on the discrete forward rate model. So if I use here sigma as a piecewise constant function, then this integral becomes a sum. I sum from the index corresponding to the current simulation time. So I, I integrate from the current simulation time to the index corresponding to the forward rate I observe. Yeah, So corresponding to the capital T. So this becomes a sum. You have the scalar product of our diffusion coefficient, the sigma times the sigma transposed, the scalar product. This guy is zero because I use this assumption uh, here. Then you just get this for our drift. Yeah. And now if you plug in the definition of the sigma with this piecewise constant function divided by one plus Li delta Ti, sigma j, one plus Lj delta Tj, then you get exactly the terms yeah, that we had for the discrete forward rate model. Yeah? Sigma i, sigma j, rho ij dt, divided by one plus Lj delta Tj in the sum, multiplied here with delta Tj. Yeah? So these are my model parameters for the discrete forward rate model. Uh, if, if I make this uh, this specification. Yeah? So you also see that one of these guys here uh, is canceling. So this this one here is, is, is canceling. So you only have in the sum this one plus Lj delta Tj. So, um, you can also have another look at the numeraire, yeah, and uh, how the numeraire evolves. Okay, and uh, maybe as um, as a last remark, um, I can view now. Okay, there is the Heath Morton model on top. I can view now short rate models as specific as special specification of the. Sigma in the Heath Morton model. I can view the forward rate as a special specification yeah, of the sigma in the instantaneous forward rate model in the, in the Heath Morton framework. So, what about the connection now between the two? Yeah? Uh, is the discrete forward rate model a short rate model? And yes, you can interpret it as a short rate model because I have now the sigma in F. And I can just go back to our slide, which describe how the short rate model looks for a given sigma function of the 
forward rate volatility. So if you have a given volatility structure for the F, you can now look at what does the short rate look like. Okay, so just plug this in and you see that you can interpret our discrete forward rate model as a short rate model with a very special um, volatility structure here and with an ultra special drift. What you will find out is that uh, the drift is uh, not uh, Markovian. Yeah, so the drift function of this short rate model is ultra complicated and it will be only Markovian in, in, in high, high dimensions but it can be interpreted as a short rate model. 